so uh, they are all uh, welcome to this discussion with Silvia Federici. I am Mathilde Kirmizopoulou uh, from the Lausa Production Group Stiftung Bade Wutteberg, and together with Alex, Alex Wisniewski, uh, the head of the program Global Feminism of the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, we are going to be the moderators. I will start with a short introduction to the event, and Alex will continue with, with the moderation of the discussion and the conclusions. Um, first of all, uh, there is the opportunity to watch the lecture via Facebook live stream in English, and for the German-speaking participants, there is the possibility to listen to the German simultaneous translation in the Zoom video conference. Um, Silvia Federici's lecture will last about 45 to 60 minutes, and after that, there will be a moderated discussion, which we will build upon your comments and questions, and will be broadcasted in Facebook and Zoom. You can write your questions in the comment section on Facebook and Zoom, as well as on the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung pad. Uh, the technical details are also available in the description of the event on Facebook and are also posted in the Zoom chat. The lecture and the discussion will be also recorded and will be available offline. And uh, please feel free, except from your questions and remarks, to share also your location in the comments so as to have a better idea from where uh, you are watching from. So now, uh, yeah, re regarding Silvia Federici, uh, there is no need for introduction. She is a teacher, activist, and feminist Marxist thinker. Her work regarding the political and economic feminist theory, the commons, women's labor, and capitalist societal organization is crucially important, not only for our dialectical feminist discourse, but most importantly, for the feminist organization in praxis, for our activism, and for our struggles. Uh, among others, her work, Caliban and the Witch, Witches, Witch Hunting and Women, Revolution in Point Zero and Wages Against Housework are cornerstones for our modern feminist movement and our feminist struggles and demands. Uh, now, uh, as, far, as far as our need to organize this discussion is concerned, it resulted from the fact that the pandemic proved to be not only a health crisis, but also a crisis of the existing state organization, its policy and structures, the power relations that it produces and reproduces, and the normality that it has imposed. Um, although the states were responding in different ways, this pandemic showcased the political and economic crisis of the patriarchal capitalist system and the dominant Western and Eurocentric colonial perceptions regarding the value of life, especially the life of the white, cisgender, male, Christian, able-bodied, and productive first-class citizen. The lives of women and feminine subjects the lives of black, indigenous people of color, of workers, migrants, and refugees, of the disabled, the elderly, and the queers, were one more time exposed to the most precarious conditions. This social distancing approach and this responsibility of the individual were the main means of the state to deal with the pandemic, highlighting the importance of individual property and leaving behind those who did not and still do not have the capital to survive and respond to the crisis. This we-stay-home we politics implied that everyone has access to housing possibilities, that home is a safe space for its residents, and that the traditional capitalist model of cis heteronormative nuclear family was the most functional one, ignoring at the same time the reality of the gender-based violence against women and feminist subjects that dominates in this sphere. Uh, at the same time, the subjects living in refugee camps, in prisons, shelters, care institutions were facing dangerous conditions, while the occupied buildings, which were also home to many other non-privileged subjects, were violently evicted before and during the quarantine and the pandemic. Uh, also during this crisis, the state in some countries, such as Greece, tried to support the ones whose work was accepted as such. For example, street workers, art workers, sex workers, migrant or seasonal workers, and workers doing informal and or illegal labor were left in a state of vulnerability and had no right in claiming state benefits and free access to healthcare services. Uh, their labor was not recognized as such, neither did it include economic relations with the state. And among them, the female workers who continued their unpaid and underpaid invisible labor, either working in the fields of healthcare, 
care work, sex work, and sanitation, and also in the domestic field. And this crisis also prepared the ground of new forms of state control and surveillance in the public space. For some countries, it was also the perfect chance to discuss and pass new laws regarding the restrictions to the productive rights and LGBTI rights, also in USA and in, Greece, in uh, Europe, taking into consideration Poland or Hungary. Um, the communication and organization between the communities, families and neighborhoods, initiatives and assemblies, and between the ones living inside and outside prisons, refugee camps, care institutions and shelters, was also controlled, hampered, and in most of the times was also made impossible. And in this after-pandemic era, if we could call it as such, new demands aroused from different movements. Demands such as defunding and abolishing the police, resulting from the Black Lives Matter movement, it may inaugurate a new era of struggles and transnational intersectional solidarity. They may create a new ground for demands and possibilities for self-defense and self-organization and for an anti-colonial, anti-capitalist, anti-patriarchal and anti-state struggle. And having all that in mind, uh, some questions may arise. For example, how could we reoccupy and redefine the public common space? Or how could we organize our economy from a feminist approach? And last but not least, uh, how could we reconstruct the private and domestic fear and the dominant Western nuclear family model? Is an intersection of international solidarity? Uh, uh, and with these questions in mind, uh, let's welcome uh, Silvia Federici, uh, whom I'd like to thank again for her contribution and critical intervention. Dear, Feder dear Silvia Federici, thank you again, and the stage is yours. Okay. Thank you, Matilde, and thank you, Alex, and greetings to all those that are listening to this discussion. And it seems to me you, Matilde, have already basically laid down the ground because your analysis is very extensive. And uh, I want to add only a few points and then we see the presentation because it shows the normality was the crisis. There is no normality to which to return. The, the normality itself is the problem. And that uh, the pandemic everywhere has only brought to the surface has only demonstrated in a more dramatic it was already there on every front. And the crisis of reproduction is the fact that we live in a system that is incapable and unwilling to systematically produce ourselves or reproduce ourselves otherwise than a subject exploit. We have seen, you know, in the last weeks and months in which the pandemic, this epidemic has raged. It's really the consequences of uh, years of years of disinvestment in all the subsidies and the services that are directed to the reproduction of our life. You know, for instance, the scandalous, you know, really scandalous lack of preparation, you know, even in countries supposedly rich like the United States, you know, in front of an epidemic that we have seen for instance, hospitals that lacked the most basic equipment, lacked beds, you know, protective equipment for the workers, for the nurses, for the doctors, uh, lack of ventilation, et cetera, et cetera. This has not been an accident. You know, over the years, for instance, hospitals have been shut down. The number of beds have been reduced. The ability of people actually to have access to healthcare, you know, have been attacked in under possible ways. Additionally, we have also seen that the condition of living have made people less and less capable of resisting to any crisis. You know, our immunity system have been so undermined 
because of the way in which food is produced, you know, the destruction of agriculture that is more and more uh, based on chemical production, the contamination of the air, the contamination of the water, all of that has created a situation in which you know, people are less and less capable of responding to the challenges that are coming. And uh, in fact, we can say that you know, this epidemic has come to the world attention because for the first time, it has affected people in Europe and people in the United States. But if we look at the history of the last 40 years, and particularly at the history of globalization, which has really been a process of recolonization, has been a process of disinvestment, you know, and in mass impoverishment, dislocation, you know, across the world, but in particular in Africa and Latin America. We see that from the late 1970s to the present, uh, there's been a constant uninterrupted sequel of epidemics. You know, in Africa, we have seen uh, Ebola, epidemics of meningitis, epidemics of cholera, Zika in Latin America, dengue fever, the avian flu, you no know, SARS. It continuously really reflecting, you know, the crisis that is taking place in the reproduction of everyday life. The fact that less and less we are given the condition, the material condition in which we can you know, reproduce ourselves. This, I think, is a very, very important fundamental uh, fact from which to start. Uh, this is not a crisis in a well harmonious, in a goodly uh, harmonious world. This, is, this, in fact, is only the demonstration that what we call normality is unsustainable. That, in fact, this system, this capitalist system, that looks at human life only from the point of view of its exploitation and looks at nature from the point of view of its exploitation is in fact unsustainable. In many ways, as people are killing today, it is, as saying today, it's a system that is killing us. And uh, I think also a second point that I want to make is that when we look at uh, the prospect for the future, I think it's important to realize that things are not going to change. That even though now the old institution are, you know, show, doing their best to pretend in a way, you know, that they are caring for our, for our health, you know, for our survival, you know, in reality, we cannot expect that the system is going to change. I mean, I've, I don't have, uh, time today, there's a long discussion that is taking place to concerning the fundamental reason why, for instance, over the last uh, three, four decades, you know, in the period that goes under the name of the neoliberal form of development, why in this period there's been such a concerted effort you know, to reduce investment in essential social services, right? So, you know, uh, the fact that it appears that despite 500 years of exploitation of the earth and human beings, the capitalist system still is not satisfied with the rate of profit, you know, that they are gaining. And uh, they need to recuperate you know, the, the rate of profit that they, they are aspiring to, now right? by reducing the investment in all the means of our reproduction. Therefore, the deterioration of the material condition of our life, it is something that we can expect to continue. That, and in fact, even today, even today, the recommendations that are given, you know, and the measures that have been taken to face, make front to this epidemic. For example, recommendations, stay home, you know, wash your hands, 
uh, social distancing. Social distancing is a terrible, is a terrible concept. As many people have pointed out, we should speak of physical distancing, but not of social distancing. All of this, right? They really speak for a limited number of people. Because for most people today, you know, the situation is that they do not have access you know, to the water. They don't have access even to a house. In the United States, we have thousands and thousands who are living in the street. The crisis of the house is such that we now have encampments of people who are living in the street in all the major capital. The house is becoming a privilege, a luxury that is less and less available because part of a subject of an object of speculation it's, and the rents are constantly increasing. So these recommendations that, uh, and the measures that are predisposed to alleviate the consequences of this epidemic are really, in fact, you have for the benefit only of a minority, you know, cons uh, as far as the, the world population or the population in the country. And we can expect that uh, the, the crisis that we have seen until now and that this epidemic has brought to the foreground are going to continue. This is very important because it determines also, you know, what kind of uh, measures, what kind of uh, activities, what kind of struggle we have to make and uh, what kind of organizing we need to engage in. But something else that I think uh, is also crucial this crisis has also brought to the surface the fact that, you know, social injustice and uh, in all its forms, but beginning with racism and also ageism, you know, the discrimination against older people, as long as older people do not have, you know, uh, economic means, uh, it's a part of the reproductive crisis. And uh, it's very interesting that in the United States, you know, the, uh, the, the crisis created by COVID-19 has been combined and exacerbated, you know, with the crisis that has followed the assassination of George Floyd, the assassination one more time of a young black man who for the most futile reason has been brutally murdered by, by the police. And uh, in a way, and not only that, but uh, this has come at a time when all statistics pointed to the fact that the majority of people in the United States who are actually dying of COVID are people in the black community at people in the black community or in the immigrant community, as well as, you know, people in nursing homes, state-funded nursing homes, obviously not the nursing home to which rich people go, but state-funded nursing homes, and of course, detention centers and jails. So it is very clear that the whole apparatus that continuously produces this equality that continuously produces division hierarchies, right, is uh, also has lethal consequences. And today many people say, we are dealing with two viruses. One virus is COVID-19 and the other virus is racism, uh, which again is uh, something that has been always there. Because in the US, even before COVID-19, the black population has had the highest form of mortality, the highest number of, of uh, the uh, vulnerability to diseases. For example, a statistic which is astounding is that today the rate of infant mortality among black women is the same than 1850 at the time when slavery, when still there was slavery, and uh, they were beginning to keep statistic about birth and death. And they were beginning to keep a census. So infant mortality and the mortality for women 
uh, in uh, delivery is the same as it was in slavery. That I think uh, it's, a, it's a very, very clear you know, sign of how slavery and racism have never been eradicated, but they've only been reconstructed, you know, reorganized in different forms. And, um, and they are part of the crisis of normality, you know, that uh, which is uh, spoken about in the title of, the, of this presentation. So it is very clear that when we are thinking of a response, when we are thinking of a response, when we look at, uh, you know, all, all the factors that are now, you know, key to uh, the destruction, the devastation, that this pandemic is producing. You know, what has the response that has to come is not only a response dealing with the immediacy. You know, for example, the many forms of mutual aid that are being organized in the community. You know, uh, everywhere I know, uh, in the United States certainly, in many different neighborhoods, activists, every organization, it's uh, in, engaged in some form of mutual aid to guarantee, you know, forms of help, food, uh, some uh, first, you know, some medical care to communities who have been abandoned, to communities that have been forgotten. You know, some economic means, for instance, to the many migrant undocumented, you know, who are not receiving the subsidies, who are not receiving the subsidies that now are being sent you know, to people uh, to make front to face the bills they have in a situation where many are unemployed. But the migrants are not receiving. I mean, as Matilde was saying before, this situation is general. You no, know, uh, and uh, it's particularly terrible for, for immigrant people because they also have to send money at home. They have family at home who are dependent. For example, many domestic workers in the U.S., many of the women are now now employed. The family have told them, no, no, don't come. And uh, here they have uh, their family, their children at home that are dependent on them. So the situation is very critical. And there's a great importance to respond to the emergency. But most fundamental is to look ahead and to look at a response that uh, look at the systemic change. Look at the systemic change because I think when we see what are the, what is, what is the path, what are the factors that have led to this situation, we cannot keep hoping, you know, that the state is going to provide the solution. We are not, we cannot hope that the state is going to, in fact, be interested in responding to the need of the majority of people. And that means that we have to organize, that does not mean, of course, that uh, we should not confront the state, particularly engaging in a struggle to recuperate, to recuperate, you know, the wealth that we have produced. Because the state now, state and capital, you know, are monopolizing the wealth that we have produced. But at the same time, that is extremely important, extremely crucial to think of a kind of organizing that begins to create, uh, you know, forms, structures from below, uh, a network of activities, of ties, and uh, from below that uh, begins to the process of redefining what reproduction is about, what is that we need as far as healthcare, as far as food production, as far as housing, and begins to connect this different struggle. In other words, that the solution is a systemic change, and that systemic change can only take place if, in a way, we find the possibility, we find the capacity to connect the struggle that today are taking place on all the different aspects of our reproduction, which means that the struggle for the housing has to connect 
with the struggle with food production, has to connect with the struggle for the reorganization of agriculture so that agriculture and the food production, the food that is produced, is not food that destroys our health, but is actually food that can nourish us and connects with the struggle for healthcare, which is not only the struggle to force the state to give us proper services and proper healthcare, but also to recuperate other knowledges that have been destroyed, to begin the process of retaking you know, the, the construction of a healthcare system also in our own hands, recuperating knowledges that, for example, women traditionally have transmitted from generation to generation and that have been systematically uh, criminalized or simply erased. So this, in my view, is the, the task, is the challenge it's awaiting us. In other words, that the fundamental task is to create the kind of infrastructure in our communities that uh, one, for, to begin with, begins to define, you know, what, what are the possibilities in terms of how we reorganize our reproduction, and two, confront the state builds the ties, the social fabric, the forms of solidarity that enables us to move, move the direction of the social wealth that is produced away from all the destructive activities in which today it is consumed, war, system of surveillance, jails, police, and redirects it in the form of sustaining, you know, uh, our, our, our life. And today in the United States, as Mathilde pointed out, as a result of the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, one, one demand that is very emblematic, one demand that, that has been, uh, you know, uh, screamed, a uh, demand presented, put on the banners in every demonstration is dismantle the police and above all, defund the police. Defund as the beginning for dismantling. And defund the police, you know, uh, as a two sides to it, which is not only take away money that has been used now to victimize, you know, above all uh, populations of color, but also place that money, those wealth, those resources at the service of the community in the so-called essential services. And I think this, uh, this revendication, right, in fact, points to the path that we should follow even more generally, you know, when thinking of social change as a whole, which is we really need to transform uh, the system and trans change dramatically you know the way the wealth is used and of course this cannot be done unless we overcome the way in which we have divided and this is why the struggle against patriarchy the struggle against the racism sexism and uh, you know any forms of nonconformity is so fundamental because today and we have seen it in the last uh, you know, we have seen it in the last weeks that one of the, of the ways in which the system can prevail is because they still can count on the fact that at times even workers, white workers, for instance, can be mobilized against black people when black people, you know, are putting forward their demand, or are demanding systemic social change, you know? So until they are able, in fact, to, to use us, against each other. Uh, this is a, is a situation that uh, of utter vulnerability. So, you know, the struggle has to move on many, many different forms. And I think that here women, and this is the last point on which I want to develop, the women have a very, very, very strategic role. You know, I think uh, as uh, those who have 
read uh, some of my work in the past, they know that uh, for a long time, I've made the point that in dealing with the question of reproduction, in dealing with the systematic devaluation of reproductive work, you know, that women for generation has suffered in capitalist society, you know, you know, we feminists, etc., have also gained an insight into what is the logic, especially insight into the logic of this system, right? The fact that this system must, you know, necessarily, you know, devalue life, you know, must necessarily, in fact, the more an activity is important, you know, for the reproduction of, of, the, of the system, the more it is devalued. And the devaluation of our life, it's really the substance of capital accumulation. It's by depriving us of uh, what we need, right? We need for the, uh, our everyday existence and depriving us and uh, confining us, obviously in different ways, not everybody, is uh, similarly exploited, it's very important to recognize the differences in exploitation in all its meaning, uh, but that exploitation is what is the substance of the accumulation of capital. You know? And I think the women have seen that, and I think also that because of the position in which we have been in the capitalist organization of work, right we have been able to see how central the question of reproduction is to the issue of social change that all the activities and reproduction by the way is not just housework is not just domestic work no over the years we have expanded the notion of reproduction in many many ways now we have seen that is beyond the housework and even procreation and uh, the raising of children, sexual work, all these fundamental, but the production includes also the relationship with nature, the relationship with the environment. Agriculture is part of the production, especially in those regions of the world, you know, where um, so putting some uh, seed into the ground, right? It's, it's part of the everyday, in, uh, everyday, uh, you know, housework and the, the care of the environment, you know, and not accidentally, because of this engagement with the productive work, we find today that women in many, many parts of the world, certainly Latin America, Africa, I'm sure Greece, you know, are those who are in the forefront in the defense of the natural wealth you know, the first to mobilize against mining, against deforestation, against uh, the continuous, you know, pouring into the rivers and ponds and water, you know, of chemical substances. And because of that, we find that, you know, more and more women are becoming victims, victims of uh, the company's guard, of paramilitary, you know, as well as government armies as a whole, you know? So I think that this kind of uh, uh, sensibility and understanding awareness that women have brought to the struggle, you know, an awareness that comes from being really the subject of reproductive work, having on their shoulder the responsibility, right, for reproducing the family, having to decide, you know, whether what how to feed one's children and uh, whether what you know uh, is given to these children is going to nourish them or is that because of this uh, understanding of the importance of reproduction i think that today women are in a very important position at the very time that today also women are those most directly impacted by the COVID crisis. Those most directly impacted. In fact, uh, you know, we know that uh, 
you know, the, the, the situation, the impossible situation that for the last uh, decades, many women have been living, you know, having a job outside the home because the male wages have been crashing. And so, so many women have been able, have been forced to also, you know, work outside the home to gain some resources. And at the same time, continuing to have the responsibility, you know, for homework, right? That has put that situation in a constant, constant tension with women facing work week that are similar to the work week they had during the Industrial Revolution, you know, from sun up to sundown. No, working, working, working without time to recuperate, without time for the creation or for other activity. Today, that situation has intensified because many women, for example, now have to work at home. And uh, they, they are in the impossible situation of having to have a job, a paid job, having to have the children while also at home from school and uh, having to take care of whatever other housework is again. So this, again, this is a classical example of how the epidemic, you know, is bringing to a, a climax, you know, crisis that were already there. The crisis is already there. And it's behind in this particular case, all the rhetoric about emancipation, emancipation through wage labor. Right. Uh, well, some women, uh, a limited number of women worldwide have gained some autonomy, you know, have been able to, in fact, uh, you know, uh, escape some of the, you know, major, the, the kind of impoverishment or dependence. But for the majority of women in the world, uh, access to wage labor is only meant to work as only men never earning enough to be really autonomous. It has meant working during the day out of the home, working at night at home, and being forced very, very often to take on debts. In the United States, the majority of women working outside their home have a lot of debt because the wages are low, so low, they do not allow them to really sustain themselves and sustain their family, right? Not having the time to take care of themselves. We always hear of women who are going to the hospital, even with cancer, at a very advanced state, because they never had the time to really take care of themselves, having to take care for everybody else, no? So we now see that, uh, you know, uh, if the, the situation that women are facing are really the one, in a way, that uh, demonstrate most forcibly you know, the necessity for a major social change and also, at the same time, that um, you know, women have, I think, a special role, a special place, precisely because of the whole history of involvement with reproductive work, you know, in this process. And, um, but very clearly, this is a process that is a political one. And uh, this is a crisis that is a political crisis, not simply a health crisis. And it's a crisis that cannot be addressed or resolved, you know, unless we move at the same time on two fronts, deeply related, which is really the enforcing of a different type of policy. And through that, the slowly changing of the system, but the forcing of a different logic that turns upside down the way social resources are used. And the other is the refusal, is the, um, you know, delegitimation of any forms of social hierarchy and social injustice. Because 
without one, also the other is not possible. We cannot really change as uh, the demonstration that have followed the, the death, the assassination of George Floyd have demonstrated. We cannot really follow any change unless we dismantle, unless we disarm the state, unless we dismantle all the forms of oppression by which the state has been able to impose you know, a situation of systemic scarcity, of systemic impoverishment, of systemic exploitation, right? Uh, the two go together. They are two aspects of the same reality. And we cannot deal with one without also dealing with the other. And, uh, you know, we are living now here, and with this I'm going to conclude, we are living now here in the United States, a very, very important and, uh, moment, a very, very important moment that, in my view, certainly will be a moment of change. How far the change will go is difficult to tell, but certainly a change because we have seen something that has no precedent, certainly not in my memory, but everybody is agreeing on that. Because for the first time, you know, those who have gone into the street to protest the assassination of George Lloyd, which is really the last of a number of assassinations. I mean, it's been over the last uh, months, you know, almost every week, one young black man or a woman have been killed for the most futile. You know, you seem to have a system that is looking for an excuse to, to kill a black person. Uh, given the way in which you know, the ease with which the police is in fact attacking people in the black community and the state of total impunity in which they have been able to do that. They have been granted by the state, by every institution, a complete impunity. Now, we have seen for the first time that a large number of white people have joined the demonstration. And I think this is perhaps, this is perhaps a consequence of the fact that the epidemic has confronted a lot of young white people as well with the sense that we are in a society that to them as well offers no hope, offers no real future. A society in which life is constantly precarious where, you know, they continuously speaks of, uh, of democracy and speaks of the American dream and etc. But in reality, you know, in reality forces everybody, you know, into a daily struggle for survival. For instance, we have a youth in the US who is completely submerged by debt because to go to school, you have to in fact, in debt yourself in a way that puts a mortgage on your whole life because this debt will follow you and determine the choices that you make for years and years to come. Choices about marriage, choices about work. So the fact that we have seen so many young people you know, in, in the streets and, and this has been very important because, as I've said before, and it's obvious, you know, the ability to divide us to places and to create hierarchy so that you have large part of the population who are not aware or not interested or, or uh, not ready to actually join the protest for those who are bearing the brunt of the system has been so far, you know, uh, one major obstacle to a real transformation. We are breathing now, we are breathing now the sense of something new. We are breathing now a, a different, a different air, a different uh, situation in which, you know, it seems the possibility that, that a process of change is opening, a process of change is beginning that the desire for change is not only coming from those who every day are paying for their lives, you know, for the racism in the society, 
but also it's coming from a broader population. And uh, I hope that in this way, you know, this pandemic that uh, has demonstrated, you know, has uh, demonstrated all, all the, it's been like an x-ray, you know, uh, of all the limits and all the crimes that are daily perpetrated in this system. You know, that this pandemic will be not only, you know, a, a, a moment of great, of great uh, pain, but it will also be a moment of transformation, it will be a moment in which the pages turn and the possibility, you know, the possibility of changing uh, a, a system, a history that so far has been a history of oppression, has been a history at home and Thank abroad. you very, very much, um, and, Sylvia. Uh, this um, is the beginning we, of I, Before we start Thank with um, the first question that came in, I want to encourage everyone again that uh, to send us uh, questions either even um, either in the chat in the Zoom or as well on the different uh, pages of Facebook. And you can also send them to us in German or if you want also in Spanish, that's uh, possible that I will uh, translate it or like read it. So we have one uh, first question from someone watching. I'm just um, reading it to you, Sylvia, and then um, we, uh, everyone has some some more time to think of questions as well. So I have some as well. <laughs> so, um, okay, the question is uh, following. Thank you very much for the sweeping overview over the current situation. You mentioned the need for a fundamental change of politics. Would you say social change can only be organized exclusively from the bottom up? Or could you give a few concrete policy demands progressive social actors should be putting forth to transform our economies. Also in a global context where there might progressive forces in government, for example, in Portugal. I place the accent on building from below because I think that this is the aspect of a struggle, of our struggle, that is most in need of construction. But definitely, there is a demand that we are now have already have been presented to capital to do with healthcare, housing, agriculture, food production. For example, in the case of healthcare, insurance company, the fact that healthcare in the United States is only possible on a very, very limited basis, only if you have certain type of jobs. And even with jobs, they have a huge premium. Okay, so healthcare, for instance, is extremely expensive, extremely expensive. So one first demand with relation to healthcare is to make healthcare available to all, right? Many, many people are working 10 hours a day. So we need a redistribution of work. For example, a work, uh, this has been on the agenda for a long, long time. So that everybody works much less and has time for many other things because even to become involved at the community level, even become involved with community-based activity, you need to have time. If you're leaving in the morning and coming back in the evening, there is no way that you can actually work with other people in your community or on your town, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So all of these issues are very fundamental. However, I think it's important education, right? We now have an educational system that is totally, totally discriminating. So you have a private you know, schools for the children of the, the middle class or the bourgeoisie, and then for the majority, 
you have uh, schools where even the roof is falling apart, where the walls need painting, and where the curriculum has been reduced to the bare bone. You know, children are studying in the United States to pass testing, and uh, all the interesting activities, you know, art, art classes, uh, music, and so on, anything that stimulates their creativity has been destroyed. So there's a major, major reform in the school. The police has, been, has to be taken away from the schools. There is a big discussion of a guaranteed income, you know, of a reproductive income. You know, that's also another discussion that is taking place. Of course, we need to understand what is the reproductive income, at what cost it may come. That's a whole big issue because there is a right-wing, the right-wing version of that, which basically say, okay, everybody should get a certain amount of money, and then we should remove the state from the business of providing services, right? So the, but the, and, and, and there has to be also a change in the organization of production, enough with producing arms, enough with producing destructive chemicals, you know, and, uh, and uh, what we produce also determines the conditions in the factories, also determines the condition in the places of production, right? Uh, that now people go to work and get sick because of the terrible conditions of work, not only the overexploitation, but the fact that many times the places where they work, you know, are totally pathogenic. So all of that, but what, what I was trying to undermine, under, underline in, uh, in stressing the, the need to organize from below is that even, even as we demand better services from the state, we need to create structures from below that have a control system. That, for example, can control, can discuss, can decide what is taking place when we go to a hospital. Today, there are women, many women fear going to a hospital because of the way they are treated, because they don't know if the you know, therapy they are given are really going to cure them or are simply sending them back to work. Right? So we need to be able to not simply allow the state to decide what they're going to give to us. And we need to have forms of control from below, which means that the, at the community level, there has to be ways. I think it's important that obviously none of us can deal with the whole. The front of reproduction is a very broad one. Right? Each of us can give a contribution. The important thing is that the struggle be connected, that we don't see the struggle over housing as something different from the struggle over jails, as something different from the struggle of isolated, but that we begin to make those connections, that we begin to build organizational connections not only in our mind, not only in our ideology, but we begin to build organizational connection. Okay. Yeah, um, I think we have some kind of problems a little bit with the, with the connection. So I will have my video off because I think then it's uh, working okay. much better. Okay. And so, so there were several questions coming okay. in. Correct. Um, I will give you some so we also have, because if, if you speak a little bit, it's, it's getting um, every time better. So I will um, collect three or four questions sure. and then give the, give the stage to you again. Okay, sure. Um, so there are different questions around um, organization, I would say. For example, there's a question, in Germany, feminist mobilization was up to now not able to reach up, reach uh, the precarious working women. So 
women mm -hmm. working in supermarkets or cleaning offices. Right. Is this different in the US and what can we learn from that example? Mm -hmm. Another question was also, um, what possibilities do we have in this moment for building a feminist movement with an intersectional perspective? So this is like um, very close to each other. And mm -hmm. um, then there were two questions on Latin America and the situation there. So we have one, uh, one question from Bolivia and uh -huh. uh, yeah. And the person is asking, I'm, I agree with you that we can um, see rebellion ship right at the moment. Um, but the problem is to um, give like the demands to formulate the, the, the um, uh, demands. So what uh, demands do we have in, uh, like when we're talking about the global uh, colonial uh, order. So how mm -hmm. to push that. Yeah. And another question was also about Latin America. Um, there are uh, different Latin American countries where I think we could define the political situation as pre-revolutionary. Mm. What do you think about the situation in Latin America? Okay. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Well, these are huge questions. And well, I'll start from the I'll start from the bottom and I work my way up, you know. The I really don't know, you know, the the concept of pre-revolutionary and revolution is so big and you know it has taken more than five centuries to build a capitalist system. And I think it will take a long time to, to change it, uh, unfortunately. So, but I would agree that, for example, uh, I've been very inspired in the last uh, years. Every time I go to Latin America, I feel that really I come back very energized and particularly from the kind of struggle that women are making there and the network of women that have been building you know that are bringing together and here it's also a response to intersectionality they are bringing together you know women in indigenous area, for example, women from the Amazon, to women who are working in Campesina, in, in rural area, urban women, women who are working in the Economia Solidaria, or Ni Una Menos, like in Argentina, for instance, right? So taking the example of Argentina, women have been able to create spaces, you know, social spaces where feminist women coming from different places. Uh, as I said, Ni Una Menos, the struggle against violence against women, the Economia Solidaria, and, uh, you know, the intersyndicale, women who are working with different unions, and so on, women from the Vigas, Vija 31, Vija 24, are, are in fact finding common spaces and discussing common strategies and so forth. This to me is, is revolutionary. Uh, this to me is beginning to break down division, is beginning to build that connective tissue that I was talking about. Right, where struggles can actually give support to each other. And it's not an accident that, for instance, in, say, Argentina, over the last uh, two, three years, we have seen a level of uh, mobilization that is unprecedented. Millions and millions of women in the street, but not only millions of women in the street, but we've also seen programs, programs of struggles 
that are very powerful because they deal with very specific issues, like the issue of death, the issue of violence, you know, the issue of colonialism, but not in separate. For example, one of the slogans in the last uh, March, you know, in Buenos Aires, you no, know, vivas las queremos e desendeudadas. Viva las queremos y de desendeudadas. Desendeudadas, without debt. So the, the struggle against debt is now being connected with the struggle, you know, against violence. And because there is, a, there is a perspective that is developing that is looking at economic policy as a form of violence. Uh, and he's seeing the connection between this struggle and he's seeing therefore the need to combine, to come together. This to me is very, very important. And I would say that this is happening not only in Latin, in, in, uh, in Argentina, but it's happening more and more in other places. And, and other things that is happening in Latin America, and I was referring to it before, is this amazing presence of women, this amazing protagonism of women in urban struggles and in the struggle in the rural areas. You know, today in the Amazonia is women, you know, that with the Sarayaku in Ecuador, the Amazonia Equatoriana or Brasilea, is women who are really saying no to the mineria, to the politics of extractivism, to deforestation. And uh, so, and in the Caribbean island too, in, the, in uh, Nicaragua, for example, I mean, women are building seed banks, you know, not to be forced to use transgenic seeds. You know? So there is a, a leadership that women are taking in the defense of the environment. And more and more, they are seeing that the struggle against patriarchy and the struggle for the defense of nature, the environment, is one struggle. That women cannot really you know, carry on the kind of defense of the environment if at the same time they are, you know, men are putting their feet on their shoulders. If men are, you know, are, if, if they have also to deal with the continuous limitation, control and, you know, patriarchal, you know, relation with men. And so there is a feminism, there is a feminism that is growing so rich. I think to me, I haven't seen anything, I may be, uh, I'm, but I haven't seen it in other places because it's anti-patriarchal, it's anti-colonial, it's anti-capitalist, and in a very, very concrete way, sees that connection between the three struggle, sees that connection and organizes around that at the same time. And so, in that sense, I think there's something revolutionary. And um, so I know that Bolivia has been going through a very, very, very heavy uh, situation. But at the same time, in Bolivia too, there are really very powerful women's movement and, uh, and you know, non movement of, of, of uh, defense of the environment. Chile. We have also seen the same trend in Chile. And so I, I will leave it here. And when we speak of intersectionality, you know, I think right there, some of the examples I made are very intersectional. But in terms of the United States, you know, we see intersectionality itself is now being used in a broad way, in the sense that the struggle over racism and sexism, not only the struggle over racism and sexism have to be connected, right? And, uh, you know, I think the idea of intersectionality, you know, have also begun to show us that, you know, 
the, at the same time, the racism and sexism are connected and have to be connected and have to be part of the same struggle. It's also important to see that, to understand, for instance, you know, the situation of black women is not enough to say one plus one, racism plus, but in fact, it's a situation which is unique in itself because the sexism uh, that black women suffer, you know, because of the unique history, the history of slavery, the history of Jim Crow, which continue into today, right, makes also the sexism they are suffering very, very unique. It's not the same thing plus racism, you no, know, but it's also some, to give an example, you know, one important difference uh and one between what what black women and white women have faced in the united states is the relation to pregnancies because black women in the majority have been systematically denied their right to maternity even today there are many policies that are basically criminalizing they are increasing the danger of criminalization for black women the moment they decide to have a child. And in fact, many black women have realized now the decision to have a child exposes them, you know, much more directly than any other group of women to the possibility of being criminalized. I could develop that later. Um, and in fact, we speak specifically in relation to black women of the criminalization of pregnancy. So intersectionality is extremely important. And intersectionality is also you know, uh, extended now to the situation of women, some who call disabled or that are physically challenged, you know, will also have a very, very particular situation that uh, you know, in addition to, the, to all the, the challenges that women encounter because of a patriarchal system. You know, also a whole other, you know, uh, set of discrimination. Yeah, so it's, it's extremely important and those struggles, you know, uh, they are organizational form. We have to obviously think of organizational form. For instance, the question of autonomy. That even if you have one feminist movement, you know, the, the, the fact that black women have always wanted to organize autonomously and not assume the black and white unite and fight. But because the moment you have an organization that does not recognize those, those hierarchies, it's the interest of those with more power that prevail. So the principle of autonomy is a very important principle at organizational level in all those situations in which you have differences of social power. And uh, I don't know the United States, you know, the feminist movement has been in a better position to deal with the question of precarity. But I have to say this, that in the United States, precarity is so broad there are not very, very few jobs that are not precarious. That now precarity is a general working class condition that affects people in different ways. I mean, obviously, if you are a migrant and you are precarious and you don't have documents and you cannot get unemployment and you have a family uh, you know, in the Philippines or in Africa that is waiting for your money, precarity is far more devastating but precarity is now becoming a condition. In fact, we don't speak of precarity of work. We now speak of precarity of existence because life is, is becoming, you never know when you have a job. And of course now with the, with the pandemic, we are in an uncharted terrain for millions of people. Uh, some say that two months from now, there will be riot in the street because already we have lines kilometers long of people who are waiting for a packet of food 
otherwise they will starve. And we haven't even seen the worst because soon the unemployment benefit will end. Soon the moratorium over rents will end. And what is going to happen now when half of the people today unemployed will not be able to go back to work? and uh, subsidies will have come to an end. All this now, it's in the balance. So uh, I would say we are now at the moment of major, major change in which in a way uh, a lot, the, the struggle has to, it has to really evolve in, uh, in also new ways. And I, I think this is, there are, there are signs that in many communities this is happening. You know, there are signs that in many communities, for example, in a migrant community not far from where I live, they are now building popular assemblies, they are now building social spaces where people are fighting over housing, people are fighting over jails, and people are fighting over fighting, organizing over housing, organizing over people in jail to demand their liberation and the end of jails, you know, and abolition. Uh, and people fighting, you know, and organizing over the issue of mutual aid are coming together and seeing how to connect those struggles you know, the kind of connection I was talking about. So there is a sign that this is beginning to happen. And uh, I'll, I'll stop here. Hello. Thank you very much. Um, so I have some more questions. Sure. <laughs> um, the first one is, um, you mentioned that the de definition of reproductive work is also extended to agriculture and ecology. Yes. Could you talk a little bit more about the relationship about this kind of repro reproductive work and urban life? Yes. Okay. There's and, another one. Yeah. And we have another question on the revolution, I think. Uh -huh. um, so concerning the potential of this crisis. Historically speaking, we have a lot of moments of crisis that can turn to revolts. That mm -hmm. makes, what makes the difference now? Ah, uh, no, sorry. What makes the difference is if people are organized enough to use these moments and actually go past the revolt to actually organize for revolution. Do you see that this is now the case. Do you see in some countries more potential regarding organizations leading this revolution? Okay, so the productive work, right? Yeah, I, I think that the relation between uh, the productive work uh, in the rural area and so on and the urban is right there, you know. In fact, one of the things one of the things that people have been talking a lot, and you know, here, uh, you know, in uh, in in March, in March and April, for instance, it was very. It, it, there was a lot of fear about going to the shop, to go to shops, and I remember that uh, if you went to a shop, you know, sometimes there'll be people buying food for the month because you were told, don't go to the shops. And if you go, you know, pack it up because, um, you know, going to the shops is dangerous. So there was all this discussion to begin. People say, "Why well, we should start producing our own food. We should start producing our own food. Or we should, you know, expand making contact, you know, with people in rural areas. So we don't have to go. So there has been a movement already in the US and in Europe, you know, to establish a direct connection 
between the producer and the, and the consumers to jump over, you know, this uh, organization of the supermarket, right? And, and this, this organization is very important, both from the point of view of money and also from the, for example, in the US, you have community supported agriculture. Community supported agriculture is a system whereby uh, people at, at the beginning of a season, they give a certain amount of money to the farmers. And then through the season, the farmers are bringing food to the town and uh, they are bringing them every 10 days, every two weeks, they are bringing these boxes of food, right? So those connections are already taking place. And the advantage of them is one in terms of money and the other advantage is more understanding, more guarantees as to what is being produced, right? Because generally those who are part of community supported agriculture, they are producing without toxic, you know, toxic chemicals, etc. I think this is going to expand. I think that the interest in knowing the source of food, in making connections that go beyond, uh, there's been a top, people are talking also, of, you know, growing your own food in your own house, if you have a little garden, if you have a, you know, there's, there is an interest. There is an interest in being less reliant on the market, less reliant on everything that is a terrain of capital exploitation. There's a terrain of capitalist speculation. And food is one of the big terrain of capitalist exploitation today. So I hope that this is going to happen but the two are deeply connected. Uh, about the question of potential evolution, you know, it's very, very difficult to, to predict what is, I think for me it's already revolutionary to go to a demonstration in New York, in Brooklyn, where half of the people are white. A demonstration to protest the killing of Brianna Taylor, the killing of George Lloyd, and the killing of, you know, some trans uh, black people and to see that that uh, half of the people are, are, are white. That is already to me something saying there's something new happening and something that gives me a lot of hope and I, I'm not alone to recognize that. You know a lot of black activists and black in the demonstration they said the same is the first time that they see that there is a strong participation. Uh, that to me is, is what will happen. For instance, we already see a backlash here. We already see that there is a population of white supremacists who will do everything in the States to defend the privilege. And uh, we have seen things that are horrendous. Um, you know, even some people have been found hanging, you know, in uh, hanging in different parts of the country, black people. So, and, and many of these white supremacists we know have entered the police, the army, so they have access to power. They have access to power. And in a situation where the, the police, you know, as enjoying so much immunity, this is beginning to end. In a number of places, changes have been made that I think are very important, you know. And um, it's, 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 when we, um, I, you know, Marx says, and here I will quote Marx saying that, um, you know, what, what we speak, when we speak, the, the revolution and what we speak of what, we are not speaking, you know, of an ideal situation projected in the future, but we're speaking of the movement that on a day-to-day -day basis changes the status quo. 
And from that point of view, the last few weeks have seen some tremendous changes, right? Those tremendous changes are not a guarantee, but, but uh, certainly we are not going to go back to where we were a year ago. Okay, um, so I would um, just make the last round of questions and um, then uh, make a quick closure. So we have two questions that are both um, around the topic of the state and the what's called uh, the particular fights you were mentioning. So the anti-racist, anti-sexist, anti-capitalist uh, mm -hmm. fight. And the question is how to, how to uni universalize them if we don't uh, work with the state. So is it possible in terms of self-organized forms of communities? So, so I, I um, joined two questions. Um, uh, one second. Uh, and then we have a question um, that just came in now. Um, if there's time, I would like to know if Sylvia considers the activity of translating a tool for building the connective tissue of the uh, she mentions. How does she see the role of translation and interpreting in the feminist movement? And I want to add one, one last question yeah. about, because you were at the beginning, you were saying that we shouldn't use the word social distancing, but physical distance. And, um, and then we were talking a lot about organizing and how do you see the how is the physical distance affecting the kind of organizing we are doing? So right. and that's the, the last round and then. Okay, yeah, social distancing and physical distancing. I mean, I think this is a point, you know, that a number of people have made and, you know, social distancing is what they always want us to do, right? They want us to think only of ourselves they want us to not think in collective terms. And, you know, the whole history of capitalism is the self-made individual, all these lies, all this, you know, and basically self-interest and all that, right? And so, and we have seen that trend even more, you know, in a, in a context of neoliberal capitalism. So I think it's very important to say, okay, the, the physical, some physical distance doesn't mean social distance. It doesn't mean that we don't talk to each other. It simply means we might, we might stay a few feet separate from each other. Um, but uh, it's very, it's been very interesting that uh, in the middle of the COVID-19, we have seen this huge, huge demonstration all over the country for weeks, day, morning, afternoon, and evening, you know, and after the killing of George Floyd. And uh, I think that people have done their best to also not, you know, be all uh, packed with each other to leave social spaces. Sometimes it's not been possible, but many times, in the marches and so on, it was possible. And I think there was a concerted effort in terms of masks, in terms of bicycles have multiplied also, and uh, both because people are not using so frequently the subway. There's been a reluctance to use the subway. And so in New York, all of a sudden, there's been an explosion of bicycles. And uh, so I think it has been, it has been possible, you know, and I would contrast that with what uh, this President Trump has done, which has been calling for these mass gathering, these mass rallies in closed spaces, right, which is really, uh, I don't know, 
what what how to label it because closed spaces notoriously are spaces in which the rate of infection is accelerated right but uh, so far i think that um, the the fear of contamination the fear of infection is not something that has uh, you know reduced slowed down and affected the protest and that protest has been one of the most powerful movements that uh, many of us have seen in a long, long time. Very, very, very powerful. For weeks, more than three weeks after the killing of George Floyd, you know, people have been in the street day and night. And, uh, you know, they protested not only the assassination of Floyd, not only the assassination of all these other people and uh, a police a police brutality and a police body that is an occupation army that is experienced in many towns by black communities as an occupation army but also a whole history you know a whole history in this country the history of slaving of the lynching of the people burnt alive people discriminated as far as health as far as as housing as far as employment you know, which then is reflected, you know, in uh, the higher mortality, you know, which means racism kills. Racism kills is in itself a disease, is a social disease, and it translates into a physical disease. And I think that this revulsion, the revulsion that has been expressed by so many people in the last week, I think has been one of the most powerful. I, I have I have experienced a, a level of emotion and, and hope that uh, uh, they had, has not been, they had not experienced in a long, long time. And certainly I'm, I was not unique. Uh, then the question of how do we universalize our demands in, uh, without passing through the state? You see, I want to make something clear. When I say that uh, we have to stress organizing from below and the place of change, the primary place of change is, if, is uh, at the grassroots level, you know, in whatever form at the grassroots level. I'm not suggesting that we forget the state. How can we forget the state? The state, it's reaching into our lives in so many ways. It's impossible not to deal with the state. It's impossible not to deal with the state. The state is our wealth. The state is the monopoly of all the means of repression. They are organizing or try to organize every moment of our lives. But what I'm saying is that as we engage with the state, negotiating, fighting, recuperating, reclaiming, uh, depending on the power relation, as we do that, as we do that, uh, we also have to put the priority, we also have to realize that unless we strengthen the ties of solidarity among us, and unless we create a kind of infrastructure at the community level, an infrastructure that enables us to continue the struggle on a broader and broader and more effective way. You know, you need to have a reproductive infrastructure for the struggles. This is something that I know in my 50 years or whatever more of militancy, one of the few pieces that I, I've come to be very feeling very sure. Yeah? In order to sustain a struggle, you also have to create, to transform your everyday life. This is also, I think, one of the lessons of the feminist movement, that you cannot transform the system without beginning to transform your life, but not just individually, but collectively. This is what I mean by community. Community is a word that actually myself, you know, we need new vocabularies 
because community is also a word that has been so misused. Right? But what I mean is that from below, we need to create, because the power that we have with regard to the state is very much determined by what we are able to create among us. That is really, to me, an important lesson. And among us means also creating infrastructure, new forms of reproduction, for example. New forms of reproduction. We have to take care of children. We have to take care of people who are sick. How many people don't go to a demonstration, you know, because they are home, taking care of people who are sick? You know, my own partner now, it fell and, uh, you know, he broke one arm. And that has limited, for example, my ability the last few two weeks to be able to go out and be on a demonstration or do things, et cetera, et cetera. But every day, there are people with chronic diseases. Yeah. We, so the, there is an issue of uh, child caring. Uh, all, all those activities have to be attended to. Today, the way they organize is insufficient insufficient because we don't have enough resources insufficient because usually our reproduction is organized in a way that isolates us from each other so we don't have the resources we need we are isolated from each other i see a movement the need for a movement that recuperates resources now how this is done of course is a big issue I'm not suggesting that this is a simple, but that has to be fundamental. You know, the idea that oh, everything is resolved if we go to work outside the home. No, this was an idea that many feminists had. We always knew that it was bankrupt, that a lot more was necessary. You know, but I feel that a lot of questions of reproduction were not were abandoned or were not dealt enough by the feminist movement. We need to change the way we reproduce our daily life in a way that is more collective, is more cooperative, that has more resources at its disposal. How that is done has to be one of the big subjects of debates. I don't think there is one model. It depends on the context from the level of power that we have, what kind of power relation, how much power we have with regard to the state, with regard to the employers, with regard to capital in general. But that has to be the, the condition with which then we confront also the state. And we confront the state so that when the state comes with certain social services, we also have a say if those social services are dividing us, are actually making it more difficult for us or actually represent a positive change in our life. Um, I, I stop here. Okay. Oh, sorry. translation. Oh, I forgot translation. No, and I shouldn't forget translation because I've done so much translation. Translation is very important. And I mean translation, days translation, that is translating literally from one language to another. But there's also translation, which is cultural translation, right? But that activity is very important. It's part of the globalizing of the struggle. It's part of the going beyond the periphery, you know, of our regions, of our, you know, uh, countries. You know, it's, it's establishing those bridges with other movements. So you have to do translations. That's very crucial. So um, thank you very, very much, um, Sylvia. Um, I, yeah, I will use this last, um, uh, your last input again, uh, as well as um, thanking the translation today. So it was so possible. It was the first time during this time that you were translated into German and we had like 160 people watching. And um, so we are very grateful for your input and also for the translation into German. And I am just 
put on the camera one last time to um, <laughs> say a proper goodbye, but I think the, the connection will fail us again. And Matilde, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I will do the same and I am really, really, really happy and uh, grateful for your contribution and of course for the participation, the contribution uh, of the audience in the critical uh, question. Thank you very much, really. No, it's uh, <laughs> difficult. Okay, thank you to you all. Eh? Thank you to the all and to the audience uh, for the question. Very. Thank you again. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. Until next time. Bye.